Hi again and welcome back. During this week we're going to take up some of the larger macro perspectives of global citizenship education, examining definitions, perspectives and issues related to globalization. Some knowledge of globalization is a key competency within global citizenship education. As this week's reading through the kaleidoscope proposes, a critical understanding of globalization is the first of five principles underlying global citizenship education. So let's start with a few basic questions. First, what is globalization? One working definition that we can start with is that globalization is the worldwide exchange of money, goods, and services, as well as the socio-cultural changes that occur with increasing change in human contact. A second question is how old is globalization? In other words, how long has globalization been a phenomenon? Globalization might be traced to the original clashes between civilizations. Remember that for most of human history, societies and nations develop separately in distinct, isolated regions of the world. Yes, there were many cultures that interacted with each other across Africa, Europe, and Asia, for instance. However, contact between civilizations in each region really just came about at the end of the Middle Ages. A big part of the initiation of the process of globalization was as it de developed in Europe, as industrialized countries began to explore, colonize, and appropriate other countries around the world. Remember, because societies had such distinct resource bases, they subsequently developed so distinctly around the world that by the time of exploration, nations appeared to be very different in terms of their resources, their tools, and their innovations. Thus, at the time of con first contacts, countries had acquired a very disproportionate amount of wealth in relation to each other. During the subsequent era of colonization, European countries sought to secure cheap raw materials from which they could fuel their own development. This of course is a very cursory history of the processes of globalization. But the point at which we've arrived at today, in today's global world, is a point in which global inequities have persisted and we live in a world that is extremely stra stratified. Global stratification is accomplished when countries of the world are defined and ranked according to their wealth or poverty. Although oversimplified, we often refer to a basic stratification between the global north, wealthy industrialized countries in the northern hemisphere, and the global south, countries that are found in the southern hemisphere, who are poorer than the countries then in the global north. Thus, a major fallout of globalization is the exacerbation of inequality due to unequal exchanges within the global marketplace. Whereas once societies were more equitable, the ability today for some to prosper at the expense of others is much more pervasive today. Statistics depicting the extent of this inequality are becoming more and more available through agencies such as Oxfam. To fully understand the magnitude, the intricacies, and the implications of these inequalities is another matter. In order to do so, we turn to various theories of globalization. First, modernization theory. Modernization theorists argue that poor countries need to emulate rich countries in terms of industrialization in order for poor countries to join the modern world. A second theory is dependency theory. Dependency theorists note that modernization theorists fail to account for the fact that richer countries exploit poor countries to fill their own coffers. A third set of theorists are world systems theorists. They investigate the political and the economic hierarchies that link all economies into a global system whereby richer nations exploit poorer ones through unequal trade relations. Manuel Wallerstein, for example, speaks of global centers that profit off of, off, off of global peripheries, whether around the world or in the same country. <clears throat> so globalization has created massive wealth in some parts of the world and absolute and relative poverty in other parts of the world. Transnational companies in particular have benefited from their ability to exploit market opportunities and low-wage labor in global south countries. Today I'm outside a Walmart store in Barrie. Walmart has been a quintessential example of a transnational company and has been heavily criticized for, for, for profiting off of inequalities between societies. 
For example, Walmart has in part become so profitable due to the low costs associated with low wages for non-unionized staff and laborers, for poor working conditions of its laborers, and for disproportionately cheap imports and supplies. Another good example of the impacts of globalization are nicely illustrated in the video for this week, Life and Death, which is set in Jamaica. A main thru thrust of this documentary excerpt is that trade laws have been developed to suit richer nations and that poorer countries are in an unfair situation. The mechanics of trade, competition, and debt uncover that nations are working on anything but a level playing field. This week's reading builds off these aforementioned assumptions about the economic perspectives of globalization and introduces how social, cultural, and political aspects of globalization are also intrinsically intertwined with the economy. In this article, Karen Pashby speaks about the intersection with multiculturalism, noting that just like globalization, these are not neutral cons constructs. Invoking the importance of critical multiculturalism in Canada, she takes exception to the common assumption that Canadians know how to do diversity. Miriam Nababi connects globalization with race, a topic that we will ret return to in more detail next week. And she notes how race is heavily linked to the transnational flow of goods and people through migration, colonization, and displacement. Samina Aidu examines religion and notes that despite the post-enlightenment efforts to extract religion from public life, religion is alive and well and, and both affects and is affected by globalization. Leanne Ingram invokes the importance of gender in considering globalization, noting how the social economy and political dimensions of globalization continue to disproportionately affect women more than men. Saskia Still illustrates how linguistic identity is akin to ethnic identity and describes how globalization has facilitated the dominance of the English language and the subsequent marginalization of local and minority languages. And finally, Angela McDonald invokes eco-justice, eco-imperialism, and pedagogies of place concepts that we will return to in week eight, and notes the strong links between social and environmental injustices in the processes of globalization. The article concludes with seven propositions made through the collaborative efforts of these global citizenship educators. Notably, these propositions include the importance of teaching the complexities of globalization, of critically engaging with dominant perspectives of globalization, of appreciating how facets of identity, including the ones they mention, race, religion, culture, gender, language, and so on, shape one's perspectives. And finally, of becoming aware of how our own perspectives as global citizenship educators have developed based on our own identity and experiences. Ingram, for one, speaks specifically about the need for teachers to reflexively engage with global citizenship issues. And this is the point that we'll pick up on next week. So for now, I'll be interested in your reactions, your responses, and your discussion about this week's focus on the issue of globalization. Speak again soon.